Do we take our microphones off while speaking? Uh, I mean, our, 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 our uh, <laughs> depends on your level of comfort, um, but I think you probably could if you stand far enough here. Yeah. Okay, we okay. We'll, we'll, yeah. Yeah. Are, we, are we supposed to speak uh, using the microphone? Or? The, the room is microphone, please. I, I guess, okay, fine. We'll, okay. we'll use microphones. Okay. Uh, Did he say keep the mask on or take the mask off? We have Patricia Severino um, and myself as leading the session. Uh, Patricia, you want to introduce yourself? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm based in uh, Brazil. Uh, we are currently working uh, with the Ancestry Network. Uh, so uh, the, the idea here would be to uh, integrate ideas on how we can uh, include a lot of or way more diversity to the um, results we are generating. Thanks, Patricia. I'm Shyam Prabhakar from the Genome Institute of Singapore. And uh, one of my projects is the Asian Immune Diversity Atlas, which is an atlas of immune cell diversity in Asia and uh, many other single cell projects as well. But perhaps that one is the most relevant. Uh, so Patricia, Patricia and I am uh, representing the genetic diversity network within the human cell atlas, and that's the topic of today's uh, this breakout session. And uh, the idea is, uh, you know, in the human cell atlas, if you really want a comprehensive atlas, then it has to characterize at least the major axes of diversity. The job of characterizing diversity is essentially infinite because there are so many forms of human diversity. So the, what we're trying to do here is more practical, trying to say, where do we start? What data sets do we have? What questions can we ask in a reasonable amount of time so that at least we'll have some 1.0 answers by, say, October next year. And so really counting on all of you to, for your ideas and also your participation in the effort, because we'll have to run pretty fast to make have some output by October next year. And, and so the major axes we're talking about are ancestry, age, sex, geography. So in many, some of you have joined the uh, uh, GDN, Genetic Diversity Network Roadmap online Zoom calls. Um, and we've, you know, if you've seen all these questions before, uh, it, you know, maybe you can re recap some of those discussions. But what came out from there is that these four are the major axes we would like to start with. Okay, my, ah, there we go. These four are the major axes we'd like to start with and, uh, and expand from there. And if we can even say something about these four axes of human diversity with some data sets and at least some subset of cell types, I'd say that we've made some progress. There are many individual teams analyzing these questions within their own networks, with their own data sets. And of course, that work will proceed. Our hope is that we can also do something cross-cutting across the different teams to integratively analyze data from across different teams to answer these questions of how do these factors affect our cell and molecular traits. So that, that's the broad goal. Um, and, and, and really, we want something practical, right? We want a group of people who volunteer their data sets and uh, who volunteer some people to analyze those data sets, but across, across the consortium. Um, anything you want to add? Um, yeah, the, the, what we have noticed is that maybe earlier on, some of these aspects were not directly integrated in what was being asked in some of the cohorts. And one of the ideas here is for us to uh, include more information in the data sets that would allow for this analysis to be more uh, comprehensive. So um, I think this is one of uh, the main points. How can we add to the data sets? And the data sets are going to be generated from now on. How could they have enough information for this kind of analysis? 
Thanks, Patricia. Also want to add the theme today is immune cells because that's where we're starting. But I know already if there are multiple groups looking at human diversity in the human cell atlas who are not looking at immune cells. Uh, uh, so I don't mean to restrict the conversation to immune cells. It's just that's the easiest place to start, particularly PBMCs, because a lot of teams have been funded to do PBMC single cell in diverse cohorts. And uh, with that, let's just jump in. I don't know if somebody has any questions uh, before or would like to add to that. Uh, so in terms of uh, immune diversity from PBMCs, we do get a lot of cell types, and I think it's been coming across. How confident are we of the individual sub cell types that what we're seeing as PBMC whole, we would not see if we do isolated T cells or because the complexity of each cell is quite distinct, at least from the immunology side of things. So is that a necessity to do isolated subsets and characterize them further? Um, so I would say for PBMCs, it's like the, the, let's say, tissue kind of in the human body where there's the most depth, breadth, everything. I mean, like Shyam is saying. So we have the best chance, I think, to um, characterize the subsets, you know, in both, both in the reference state, but also, I mean, the COVID has been a <laughs> an opportunity in that sense. It's been an amazing opportunity because there are probably thousands now of, you know, mild, moderate, severe, critical, whatever, and so on. So, you know, I think that. I understand what you're saying is that you kind of resolve each one, but even for the rarest of the rare cell types, by aggregating all the data now, there should be, let's say, it, like even at a 0.01%, frequency, there should be hundreds of cells now if you aggregate all the data. So from, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, but they wouldn't be spread by Ah, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. So the question but, is yeah. Oh, okay, now I understand. Yeah, I, th I think that was still an open question, right? I would say. Definitely, we don't know the answers to these things. Um, but it's a, it's a good point. I should say we're working very closely with the Immune Cell Atlas because that's our, that, that's our focus. And so cell typing, uh, that's a question that's come up in the Immune Cell Atlas as well. Should you look at, uh, zoom in on facts purified populations? or should just do PBMCs as a whole. Currently, the thinking is, let's just do PBMCs as a whole. As Sarah was saying, even if you do that, we have 10 million PBMCs that we have access to uh, in terms of data. So you know, we can get reasonably rare cell types there. They may not all be abundant enough to look at ethnic specific differences, but even for the more common cell types, looking at ancestry differences, sex differences and all that, it's not a solved problem, and we really don't know the answers. Yeah. Uh, one, one, one thing just to add to what he was saying is uh, exactly we don't know, for example, how many individuals we would need in order to be able to stratify the results based on ethnicity or uh, ancestry. This is one thing we are also working on. Hi, uh, I'm Hari Nakshatri from Indiana University. I think it is related to the same aspect the reference itself may have to be refined based on the genetic ancestry. For example, the recent sequencing of 910 African genome showed that there are 300 megabytes of extra DNA in African genome. 120 of them uh, megabytes are present in the Asian genome, but not in the reference. That affects about 315 coding region itself. The protein coding region itself varies. So how do we consider a reference genome then? Do we need to refine that first before we integrate all of our data? That's my question. That's a great question that gets to what are, what's our output? What are our concrete deliverables? Before I get to get, uh, get to that, I think Sarah had a comment on the previous topic. So, so I guess my question relates to this, you know, question as well, and that is, you know, is it actually meaningful? 
I mean, I would be curious to know what people feel. Um, you know, is it meaningful to sort of say ancestry or ethnicity, or should we be thinking about alleles? You know, to what you're saying, because because all of us are kind of like such complex. Or you know, if I look at my life and so on, like hybrids from all over the world, different ancestries. So it's like, is it meaningful to kind of put human beings into these boxes, or should we just be talking about alleles? I don't know. Exactly, and that's a big topic that's come up come up in discussions um, that we've both been part of. And uh, yeah, our current answer is let's do both. Uh, but yeah, open to opinions. I'm Mike, I'm an editor at Nature Genetics. I just wanted to comment on ancestry in genetics. And I think it is important to like be aware that ancestry and ethnicity are distinct concepts. And I think there's a lot of discussion in genetics about underrepresented populations and so forth. And I, and I think, you know, like we are, in the genetics field, there is some movement towards a consensus on how, what language to use and how to approach these questions. So I think, I don't think the HCE needs to necessarily reinvent the wheel, but I think there is, you know. Sorry? Oh, oh Lord, um, I'll try. So ancestry is, genetic ancestry is defined from the data. Ethnicity involves, and ethnicity and race, these are involving more social categories that are not, defi not defined using genomic data. That's a really high level kind of summary, essentially. Yeah, th thanks for bringing that up. So we, we have at least internally discussed the difference between genetics, or let, let's say ancestry, which for us means genetics, uh, and race, which is about perception and ethnicity, which is, so race is about external perception, ethnicity is more about your own culture, right? And the, ideally, we would separate those out in, in our analyses, but the thing is they are so correlated in many cases, we may not have the statistical power to say what is a race effect and what is an ancestry effect. What, what we can do right now with this much statistical power is we can say, okay, Let's say, I'll give an example of Singapore from what we're looking at. Malay ancestry individuals versus Chinese ancestry individuals in Singapore. We see these differences. It could be a genetic difference. It could be a cultural difference. It could be about the racial conditions that they're in, that they face. We cannot separate those out, but at least we can describe it and then start the process of trying to explain where, uh, where it's coming from. If I may, I think the de which definition you choose to like focus on also depends on the whatever trait you're looking at, of course. If you're looking at health outcomes where we know that race and ethnicity play a much larger role in the differences, then you should be talking about and thinking about race and ethnicity. I think for other traits, which are you know less more basic ones, then you can talk about ancestry. I think in the certainly in the papers that we get, we uh, more on these kind of, yeah, like data-defined traits. And we do tend to talk about ancestry because I guess that's the one that's most easiest to define. You know, you can rigorously, quantitatively define it. And I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an open question about how to treat race and ethnicity. I think it's a difficult question and it really, yeah, it depends so much on the context and what you're trying to do. Exactly, and race means different things in different parts of the world. So. In Singapore, I'm, you know, Indian is a race. Whereas in the US, Indian is a nationality or an ethnicity, right? So uh, I think that's the next level of difficulty in terms of defining So that's why we're starting with what we can tractably in a data-driven way analyze. But completely understand that the interpretation and the causal factors may be racial or ethnic factors rather than genetic factors. That just comes with the territory. So, uh, I guess related to that, in terms of, so I'm Karina Ganesh from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Um, uh, in terms of the data that you're actually collecting, right, and, and maybe we should, we, what 
we are doing now, what can be abstracted from the data that is currently collected, and perhaps what would be an ideal, perhaps a discussion about that. So from the single cell data that you're collecting on PBMCs, to what extent can we get information about SNPs, for example, that might be informative in terms of genetic definitions of ancestry, um, HLA types, for example, or other things? I mean, maybe you could just comment on that. Great question. Uh, some kind of genetic information is compulsory for all our data sets within the genetic diversity network. So everyone, all the teams that have signed up, they're doing either genotyping chips or exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing. But one way or another, we have genotype information on all the individuals. So we can do QTL analysis, A. We can also do data-driven ancestry. Because, uh, and we have self-reported also, so we, we analyze both. Uh, just adding to that and uh, to what the other colleague was saying, this is the easiest part. The hardest part is the ethnical background and also other questions because uh, we, um, across different countries and cultures, it's very complicated to get that kind of information from them. So I think this is going to be the more uh, complicated level of um, integrating and comparing data. There's one question here. Yeah, hi, Sophia George, I'm University of Miami Middle School of Medicine, Florida. I just wanted to contribute to the whole race, ethnicity, ancestry, and um, so one of the things that we have to also think about is where we're doing the sampling. Um, so for example, we know that at least in context of the United States and, and immigrants, that when people move from one country to another, their um, propensity to develop a certain type of disease, like say um, cancer, shifts based on where they were originally from. Now, their genetics is the same. So there's a difference in the environment and exposure, which in the context of race, in the United States at least, there is this aspect that might be changing the way that their genes are expressed in those cells. So I would say, yes, we, can, we capture everything, and we take also geography into context. Absolutely. That's why geography is in our list of four top axes. It'll be the harder one to analyze because when you change geography, you have technical batch effects, also lab-specific batch effects. But we do have, I mean, that is a major influence, as you mentioned. So, so I was just saying, so for your question about the genetics, I mean, the way I understood your question was more about how accurate, like how accurately you can impute the genetics, let's say, from the single cell RNA sequencing data. Was, was that what you meant? Or the, yeah, so so I would say you know you can get to a a reasonable level of imputation, let's say from you know a certain I don't know ten thousand or a hundred thousand PBMCs, you know, at a certain depth of single cell RNA sequencing, and also HLA uh, typing. So SCHLA, for instance, do, you know, does that to a reasonable accuracy from a, a PBMC data set. Um, but I think what Chaim was was referring to was that for some subsets of data you have in addition genotyping or whole genome sequencing. Was that, was that what you for, meant? For the major or? data sets that people who've you know, volunteered to contribute their data to this effort, they all have some kind of independent genotyping information. But uh, and I think Sarah has a paper where the genotypes were inferred or ancestry was inferred from the single cell RNA data alone. And um, there are multiple groups now uh, doing algorithms for that, because not everybody would have collected genotyping data. So I think that will be very valuable. Well, yeah, so it's just a matter of turning it into a pipeline that can take single cell RNA seq data. Yeah. So it's quite doable. Yeah, the American Society of Human Genetics in December has come out with a policy statement on how ancestry, ethnicity, and race should be used in genetic research. Maybe one way to move forward is to go through various societies, what they are using in a common phrase, and that way we are not reinventing the wheel or coming back later on, we are not using the terminology in the right way. Absolutely. The, we are not the arbiters of what these terms mean, and we are not the ethics society that determines how to address them. That there's so many committees and bodies that are doing that work already. We're just 
reading the documents they produce and trying to implement those principles. So the point is very well taken. Wanted to come back to your uh, earlier point also, Harry, about the reference. You know, when you have a reference that's generated from a diverse cohort, then you see lots of things that are missing in the initial non-diverse reference. And so that's why in the HCA we're trying to say, we're trying to work with all the organ networks or tissue networks to say, from the start, can we try to incorporate diversity into your atlas, right? rather than starting out with a non-diverse atlas and then later on projecting uh, more diversity onto it, which is a human genome program. Right? Started out with a non-diverse diverse genome, then we had 1,000 genomes, and then we had all the genome sequencing efforts. Here, we want to bring in diversity early on, but the question is, what does that mean? Right? Hi, uh, I'm Luis Montano from uh, here at CCRI Vienna, the Children's Cancer Research Institute. Um, I'm more of an observer, and I just wanted to make a small comment. Um, uh, first of all, yes, I, I, I found quite impressive that still to this day we see these uh, divisions between, like, uh, I think one slide yesterday was showing, like, black, white, Asian, uh, Hispanic. I mean, these are just two too narrow, and, and they're introducing bias, right? Because you're mixing things that shouldn't be mixed together. Uh, that's the first point. Uh, that's, I, w I think it's, I don't know if it's uh, US-centered or something, but it's uh, definitely we should move on from that. Um, th this, the second point is um, maybe there's some approach that probably the human genetics societies have taken about maybe ontologies, and in some way it's similar to gene ontologies, where you have like the very more general terms, and then you go down to the very specifics, and you have like an ID that kind of potentially like puts all these uh, specificities together, and you can you can you can define the granularity to the whatever level you want, yeah, or you or it's interesting for your specific analysis, yeah. So you can say, well, uh, and and for this phylogeography is probably quite important, uh, saying yes, people in this part of the world, people from that part of the world with these particular alleles that correspond with these ancestry of some sort, you know, it's like all together, and I think that's feasible. That, that point comes up a lot. I'm going to pass it to Patricia to address, but first, uh, if you're online and you're jo watching this, uh, please type your questions in the online platform, and they can be read out and we can address them, and please vote on the questions that you like as well. Uh, on, on granularity, just um, adding, um, referring to what you're saying, uh, we do have a lot of issues deciding what kind of questions we're going to ask when we are collecting data. So it cannot be a super long data uh, collection uh, moment because uh, for us, for example, in Latin America, we are also collecting data from people that live uh, in uh, uh, remote locations, you know, and that have a uh, Sometimes it's complex to communicate with them, uh, things that we would like to communicate, and we do engage with all the local communities to be able to speak to them and um, uh, make them understand what is the, the point of us asking so many questions. So it's a very uh, touchy uh, thing to, to, to go through. So how much granularity do we really want? And that's why many times we end up uh, sticking to ancestry uh, genetic based uh, um, uh, spectrum because then uh, this is not um, so complex to address but n what we do want is to include all this other kinds of information because we do know at the single cell level and gene expression all that is going to count like the geography and background and habits and the interactions that they have with other communities so it's an ongoing uh, process, right? And uh, as Soyan said, like how much do, can we do now, right? Like before we start collecting some new data sets, what have we already established and learned, like what is necessary? So it's really an ongoing, and that's why we're here, right? Like to, to try to establish uh, and go uh, see which directions we could go uh, to. Okay, so um, Peter Eck from University of Manitoba in Canada. So I'm also like you, I'm more an observer here. I'm not very familiar with the HCA. I'm very, I enjoy the meeting. But 
the question I have, you say, okay, we've got these data. We've got the sequencing, we've got the genotyping, we've got the single cell expression. We maybe have environmental questionnaires, which are heavily important as well. Uh, that sorts a lot out, but what are your goals? Like, immune system is a lot of things. <laughs> and you said you're looking for new cohorts. Do you look for cohorts with IBD? Do, are you looking for cohorts with allergies, viral infection? So that's very unclear. I, I, I understand you now that you just try to get inspiration of what you want to really have in regard of where do we start from, but do you have any tangible outcomes already in mind or are you creating that right now? Thank you. That was a slide I was just typing out. <laughs> so, <laughs> which, uh, okay, it's not on the screen. And while that's coming up, Sarah has... Yeah, so, so for the um, comment about the lung paper, I mean, I was just going to say that's kind of where I was coming from with my question. So just, just to that one. Uh, initially saying, yeah, should we just be considering alleles? And then Shyam said, well, we should be considering both, you know, both axes. Um, and, and then, you know, the question is, what level of granularity do you consider when you describe uh, ethnicity? And, and it was obviously extremely coarse in that paper. Um, and then we had a debate, well, should we, you know, these six categories or whatever for 440 samples, should we actually even provide that information or not? And then the feeling was actually it is useful to have that information because if you don't have it, you don't record it, you don't even know what your distribution, uh, you know, across the these these of diversity is. So that was just to that point. And there was also discussion on Twitter and and discussion in the community. And there, are, you know, a hundred authors on that paper, and there was a lot of discussion around it. And that was kind of our conclusion: is that it's better to have some record rather than actually not recording at all. Um, and then to the other point is what's the aim? The aim of the human cell is, is to provide a, a healthy reference so it's not to cover all disease states. But then the question here, so it's more like population genetics rather than GWAS association, if you like. But, but, it's, but it's not pop because that's the tissue where that's most accessible and where there's most number of samples at the moment. It's, it's, it's harder to get a piece of your skin than to get a blood draw. So that, that's the simple reason. I mean, uh, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. That's exactly the reason the number of consortia that were funded for immune diversity analysis is much larger than the consortia funded for diversity analysis in other tissues. So that's where we'll have the most data. And as Sarah said, it's most accessible. But that's not the be all and end all. And so Hari's got a diverse cohort for breast tissue analysis. And uh, Jose has um, uh, nasopharyngeal samples. And Sophia, I don't remember what sample types you have in your cohort. But there's, there's many other tissues as well. Uh, but this is where we're starting. And then you asked about uh, IBD and autoimmune, other autoimmune, infectious disease, and so on. Uh, we're starting with healthy plus COVID. And then we'll zoom out from that. Uh, the question is, if you work with healthy, you probably wouldn't need any environmental, en environmental information because they're healthy, right? That's the bottom line. That's the basis yeah. for the I whole thing. Do you? I see some people shaking their heads. <laughs> <laughs> exactly not. And as a matter of fact, I think that understanding how the responses are, uh, considering everything that we've just said, right, it varies even like within healthy individuals. And uh, I don't think we're going to talk so much here about the immune uh, system network, right? But there is going to be a session later on uh, this afternoon, so you can maybe go to see what they're doing because uh, they do have all that. They have the normal, but they also have diseases and they have the activated uh, immune cells from different systems too. Uh, it would be great, I think, if you join that. <laughs> so just as an example, uh, if you have a country where with a um, big allergen burden, okay, or even seasonally, let's say in California in summer, spring, you've got hay fever, in winter you don't have much hay fever, so the healthy cohort still has all kinds of stuff going on, and it's seasonal. Yeah, and it's they have fever, they're not healthy. They have <laughs> okay, so that then it comes to a definition. <laughs> yeah. it, 
it comes to definitions, everyone has something going on with their body, right? And we don't know everything. So when we say healthy, what we mean really is not selected for any specific disease. So they will have in practice, our definition of healthy is not like devoid of any pr problematic conditions. It's a uh, general, essentially general population. And they probably, some of us are doing, implementing that they're not very sick when they come in to donate blood. But not everybody is implementing that. Okay, so right? not everybody is healthy. I don't, don't want to take over the discussion. <laughs> not everybody is healthy in your cohort. Oh, sorry. So not everybody is healthy in your cohort. So you've got phenotypes that are, I would say, I've got hay fever and I'm not very healthy when I have it. I personally feel that. But I guess if I want to use the data, you will have a definition for that subset of data saying, oh, this is a person that has hay fever or something like that. Ideally, uh, I, I don't think uh, you want to address that. They are going to love him at the immune uh, <laughs> system network, so <laughs> you really shouldn't go there. They, they're going to explain a lot about that. But in bottom line is uh, we do not have all this uh, information and you know, like we're gonna have the basics, right? And we're not gonna select for people who are like diagnosed with something, but bottom line, your body's always answering up to something that is going on, right? So yeah, you're right. There's a question. Yeah, so one aspect uh, of diversity could be uh, also focus in a separate population, right? So for example, if you take birth cohorts, which were collected, so for example, we have a birth cohort, which uh, it's a high risk allergy birth cohort. So one or both of the parents have allergies, and the reason is allergies are extremely inherited, but we still don't know where the heritability lies, right? So genetics hasn't answered a good question. So there, the immune diversity could be probably the answer because the immune regulation and dysregulation is where the allergy comes from. Uh, we have different Singapore ethnicities, as you know. So in that context, would that be a diversity to look into where there's an inherent predisposition, at least which is genetic, and you are, it's a biased population, but it enriches in a certain risk factor of sorts, right? So that could be one aspect to look at, which is not diversity in the traditional sense, but it could say if you have the same predisposition but under different ethnicities, and in Singapore, as you know, the environment is pretty much the same throughout the year. It's hot, humid, and we all have allergies in a sense, right? So uh, i wondering whether birth cohorts or risk cohorts, would that be one way to look at? So it's a very nice example of a more general point in the GDN. We're all doing, within quotes, healthy cohorts. Uh, but the idea is that these will all serve as references for, say, disease studies, if you call allergy a disease, uh, in, that are relevant to the local researchers and the local population. So we really hope we can enable that. But st we're still, for now, restricting our scope mostly to, within quotes, healthy cohorts. I think one way to handle this normal is to have a lengthy questionnaire of all the donors, including, I mean, we in our breast normal breast tissue collection, we have a questionnaire which runs about 10 pages, including the history of parents to their current medication, the previous medication they have. In case if you find something unique for the particular sample, you can at least go back to your lengthy questionnaire to either include or exclude. I mean, if you look at that, 40% of American population is on a medication on an everyday basis. So do you consider 40% of American population abnormal? No. So we need to somehow come up with a definition where something is normal and something is need some uh, intervention. That questionnaire is extremely valuable. And certainly in our cohort, we have a long questionnaire as well, not 10 pages, but not far from that. And that will be valuable, essentially, covariates to correlate with the data as our cohort gets bigger and bigger. But it's not always possible. So, so Sarah Tishkoff is, is a co-lead on the Genetic Diversity Network. She does field work and collects samples in very remote places where you have zero medical history, zero uh, medical information. You can't even do any basic blood tests and so on. Uh, you just take what you get, and your metadata is very minimal. So I think it really depends on where the samples are being collected and what information you have. So it will be different for different uh, data sets. Hi, um, I'm Bailey from CZI. 
And um, I wanted to follow up on a comment that Sarah made um, about the Lung Cell Atlas and how you, you, know, you're, you ended up being like, it's better to include it than to not include um, some of the ethnicity information. And one thing that um, we've been thinking a lot about and a lot of in um, conversation with a lot of you all in the room um, is the idea of making sure that the data is reusable in the future. And so um, with that is, um, to the point that Sarah made, making sure that you know there is something reported, and so because there is so much information, if you go and look in single cell, like available single cell biology data, that's just it's largely unknown, and that you know now we we are trying to use it, and you really can't use it, and so we've had conversations about minimal metadata that can be collected, and so one conversation I think, or one question I have for the group is just to kind of follow up on this idea of minimal metadata, and with the Lung Cell Atlas as an example of, you know, they, they made sure to include something. Um, is, that, is that a step, is that a step in the right direction for like other bio networks? You know, we're talking about immune here, which is really important, and I think the, the conversations and questionnaires are also important, um, but then kind of thinking back to some of the other bio networks as well, um, is including, is there some amount of minimal metadata that we can, that can be used, um, whether that's ethnicity in these, you know, larger buckets that it's not adequate, but is that a step that can at least make the data more reusable in the future? Thanks for that question, Bailey. You brought up two points. One is, and I want to come back to that point, which is what are we going to try to achieve, okay, and try to achieve meaning report to the community. But then the question of minimal metadata, we discussed that in our roadmap um, Zoom calls, there was very strong pushback from groups that said, we cannot, we cannot collect any metadata, right? So if you can impose a minimal metadata standard, we won't meet it, what's the point? So um, yeah, we kind of shied away from that. You can do minimal metadata if you're collecting in very specific research intensive locations in the world. Uh, otherwise, it's hard to impose that. But I, I, there's one more question where I'd really like to bring this discussion to. What does it mean? I, we kind of have an idea what an immune cell, at, uh, cell atlas means. So we, somewhat, we know what it means, right? And what we want to achieve there. What is a genetic diversity atlas? What, what are, or let's say we incorporate diverse data sets into the immune cell atlas. How does that change the immune cell atlas? What, what does it mean to incorporate diversity in the immune cell atlas? In the human genome, it's easy. We, incorporating diversity means, you know, you assemble it from many, many different genomes, so you have all the genetic variants there in your initial uh, map or genome assembly itself, right? In the human cell atlas, what is the, what is the analog of that? I'd like to get to that question, but I, I think Karna, yeah. yeah, I wanted to go back to the metadata question. I think there are two points I'd like to make. One is, uh, as you're pointing out, there's a lot of pushback on these fronts, and we do this in cancer genomics all the time, right? Um, the, part of the reason, I think, is that funders, <laughs> CZI, uh, often don't pay for annotation, and it's incredibly labor-intensive and painful to extract this information from clinical records, from 10-page questionnaires, input the data, input the data in forms that are reusable by others. <laughs> And I really, I want to make a really strong case for, I think funding agencies need to recognize this and pay for it, and that's the only way to get the metadata um, in a usable form. Um, and um, the second thing is, what then, the more granular the data gets in this way, what I think that increases our obligations ethically to report back to patients and to the, do the people who've donated their tissues, right? And so what are the ethical complications that raises? In the US where we are, this has in implications for insurance companies and, you know, our patients sometimes refuse to get genetic testing because that may have insurance cost implications for their entire families. So how do we address these issues in the context of the HCA? As in reporting a uh, return of results? Who's paying for your metadata? Uh, yeah. Who is what? Who's paying for your metadata collection? <laughs> Actually, it's part of the project. So uh, it is part of the project. It's funded by the project, right? So we have people who are collecting samples, and they also collect metad metadata. We do not go to medical records. And the kind of information we collect are going to be de-identified. So we do not go back. They're not patients, right? They're don't, uh, 
donors and uh, they are not going to be uh, contacted later on about results. We're not going to do any genetic testing. We're just doing single cell RNA seq. So, yeah, yeah, but we're not really going to uh, have access to their medical records or be talking to their uh, doctors. And I think that depends on the on the bio network specifically. Here we're talking about PBMCs and we're collecting blood. It's different from other bio networks. So I think this question must be much more relevant maybe for other ones like breast, for example, where they might be able to get some data. So maybe he wants to comment on that. Sorry, no. Oops. So, uh, yeah. In our case, we do send every birthday a birthday greeting card to them and ask them, are there any changes in your health? So based on that, we have the breast tissue from women who developed breast cancer two to five years after they donated their normal breast tissue. So we have a separate cohort of those tissues as well as those who did not develop breast cancer in place. So we are comparing them. So collecting the data subsequent to the donation has a lot of value if you are looking at the disease context. Sophia, you want to add to the metadata discussion? <laughs> I actually wanted to say something about the return of results because, at least in the U.S., the GINA, GINA which is an act that prevents discrimination, um, allows us to be able to return results to individuals who consent to receiving the information um, in the context of hereditary cancer, breast and ovarian cancer. Um, in context of the metadata, my goodness, we collect a lot of data. Um, and really, the, in, the intent initially was so that we can capture context, um, space, and time of where people came from, um, where they are, their exposures. And um, our goal is always to um, integrate that data, that type of data, onto the tissues that we study. So both at the epigenetic, transcriptional level, and also, of course, genetic variation. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, Mike's been waiting patiently. Oh, it's OK. Um, I have a new question, and it's about outputs, and I just, I'm going to try and make sure I just don't ramble for the next minute. So from looking at, like, taking GWAS as, as an example, because I think this is a, you know, GWAS where very clearly there is a problem with genetic diversity. I think one observation is that, you know, you have to, you know, if you're going to increase your diversity, you actually, that has to be a, a serious effort, right? You can't just do it passively. You have to go out and actually go to speak to the people who are underrepresented and get them. So this is a question out of my ignorance. What is the HCA doing about that specifically? To t uh, is there a way to, like a mechanism to recruit underrepresented people? And in terms of outputs, I was, and this is going back to the question of what the, you know, what is a reference atlas of genetic diversity is. I was... Coming at it again from the perspective of, you know, GWAS and genetics broadly, I think, you know, there's a, there's a probably geneticists would want to see QTL analysis, right? I think that would be a very important specific deliverable that would be, have an enormous range of downstream uses and so many things. And I would, yeah, I'm just wondering, is that, is that part of the plan? Because I th that's the kind of thing that would really increase the impact and I'm, not so sure how interesting it is to have, you know, like a cell atlas where we can say that there's a presence absence of a cell type. That's that kind of molecular level data, I think, which is going to be the most impactful. Short answer, yes, QTLs are on high on the agenda for all our diversity networks. For your first question about what is the HCA doing for outreach yeah. to underrepresented communities, I'm going to bump that up to a higher level Maybe, Sarah, you want you want to address that? Well, so this funding, so so, so I mean, uh, during the pandemic, basically, we we kind of there were a, a bunch of different things that happened, Black Lives Matter, and so on, and, and and lots of things that kicked off, basically. But already, actually, in the original white paper, there was already kind of commitment to diversity back in you know, when we started off in 2017. But then this kind of sharpened the, the resolve and, and we have a commitment to, um, to basically 
uh, lobbying funder, so they set aside you know, a, a good fraction of funding, basically to increase sample diversity. And we are obviously committed to increasing and, and, and um, you know, being inclusive and increasing scientific uh, researcher diversity. I guess the, one of the, the outcomes of this session could be like quantifying that what does diversity mean and, and the, you know, the way it's worked out in this round of funding grants, but you may not be aware, but what Chime is referring to is a network of, of awards from CCI called Ancestry Networks. And, and basically, each one kind of has a, a different tissue and basically different kind of geographical locations and, and populations and so on that they're looking at. So it's not, I would say, the most systematic kind of approach at the moment. So if we can get to a more systematic approach, that's great. Maybe, maybe, yeah. <laughs> and, and any insights from you on that topic or kind of guidance would be very welcome. And uh, so for the QTL thing, yes, absolutely. I mean, there are various, uh, that's a very active area of research. And I would say the cellular level is actually linked to the molecular level. I mean, it's, it's one and the same in my mind. You know, if you have an absence, then you've got basically absence of expression of a program. Um, and of, you might be aware of our paper, which is sitting with Tiago on this topic. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Eugenia from the Center for Molecular Medicine, Vienna. On the systematic um, way, I have a question. So with the human cell atlas, we are a bit stuck with profiling the human samples that we get to, and the metadata turned out extremely hard. That's something, the challenge that I realized now. And I wanted to ask if, um, if it would be completely impossible to think about um, somehow making a branch of human cell perturbation atlas or something like this, where we would systematically try to assess um, various SNPs, for example, with base in technologies or various genomes, for example. We, I mean, uh, the ideal case would be if we had the instead of the mouse house, a human house, where we would have all the genomes and try to see the PBMCs and modify them accordingly. But in our case, maybe we can try to think about inducible uh, pluripotent stem cells, trying to modify them with the CRISPR technologies and trying to see how exactly the immune cell states would behave according to the perturbations. Is it completely unthinkable? Would it be helpful? That's is what I wanted to ask. <laughs> That's a great question. Again, our initial stab at it is just the unperturbed samples that we get. But then the next question is how do these perturbations, how are they influenced by genetics and environment and so on, the response to those. Uh, Luda Franca had a very nice paper on in vitro stimulation of immune cells and the genetics of that, the QTLs in the stimulated state versus the unstimulated state. Uh, you can say ancestry is another stimulation, in a sense. How do QTLs differ between ancestries? And Joseph Powell's recent paper had some very nice analysis of that, combining his data and Jimmy E's data, which, which are in large cohorts. So, so yeah, we, that's why I said in the beginning, categorizing or characterizing human diversity is an infinite, infinite task. Uh, what we do want to get to disease perturbations, deliberate in vitro perturbations, ancestry perturbations, all of those. Lifestyle, um, seasonal perturbations. Shyam, just to, to help out, uh, within the ancestry network, we do have that aim. So uh, since everybody's working, or many people are working with PBMCs, then to do the uh, different kinds of experience, experiments of cell activation, different kinds, so we can see uh, what kind of... Um, impact we have after, depending on ancestry. Right, <clears throat> thanks. So my name is Fidel Ramirez. I'm here from a pharma company, Böhringer Ingelheim. And I just want to mention that, you know, having um, genetic information is something that we're missing a lot currently in the data that is already, already available. That's, that, therefore, this initiative, I think, is going to be uh, tremendously important and <clears throat> is going maybe to show the way for other atlases, how this can be done. To give you an example, we have, I have looked at single cell data from three patients, three donors, anonymous donors, they just donate the blood, differentiate uh, some monocytes into macrophages, complete different. 
but we don't know why. We don't know. We don't. We, we have no metadata. We just know. We just know that they're very different, but we don't know why. So this variability, and I don't see this variability, by the way, in other cases, but mostly in in, in blood. It's already available. Uh, MHC2 complex differences, and it's, it's like bl black and white. So therefore, I think it's, it's, it's very important to get all this, all this information out. Um, but I understand that you're going for micro arrays, right, for the, for, for the genotyping, and th this may not capture the full variability. So I hope that you know, this can be extended maybe in the future to have a whole uh, genome sequencing. How this is going to look like, um, we already know that you know, some, some people carry mutations, but in which cells, how do they affect uh, they, are, they look healthy, but maybe they, 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 they are already prone to, to develop some disease. And having this information connected to, to, to the immune system is, is just going to be fantastic. We're looking forward to that. And uh, Patricia, you want to comment on whole genome sequencing? Genome uh, yeah, we actually, um, many times we do go for the SNP arrays because of costs, right? And then we have a general idea, at least, of some of the markers. But people do uh, are trying to do uh, uh, low coverage uh, genome sequencing uh, for that reason to increase uh, maybe some aspects that we cannot get over there. But it's always a matter of cost. I mean, May I have a, a short comment? So there are these very large uh, biobanks now now growing, like the uh, Genome England. They have probably half a million full uh, genome sequence. Uh, we have UK Biobank. Um, they are more at sniper rate. We have uh, Well, they already tackled the aspect of metadata because you get really a lot of metadata. So this, this problem probably has some already been uh, kind of discussed uh, a lot, and you maybe can approach this. These, these people for, for, for guidance. Um, but I think it's the, the economics of that, I think, are possible because if they're doing half a million people whole genome sequencing. Um. But, but it always <laughs> depends on where you are and which blood you're collecting, you know, because uh, uh, of course over there they have different kinds of infrastructure. Uh, so, right? <laughs> so I just wanted to um, briefly mention our um, Ancestry Network funding that, was, that supports um, breast, fallopian tube, and prostate epithelial single, single cell, single nuclei sequencing across six places. So um, West Nigeria, Kenya, Haiti, Bahamas, Jamaica, and Miami. And so that is our contribution to the Ancestry Network. One of the things that you, know, you, you all were talking about, the, the, what is normal. Um, so one of the things that we observe in, in the Caribbean and in Miami is benign ethnic neutropenia in blood. Right, and so of course, if you're not capturing that population, you're not going to see it. So um, I'm a pr uh, we're planning on collecting, and we have collected PBMCs, although that's not part of our funding to do any analysis. But we'll have the the material um, to contribute. I think I, I think uh, commenting on something he said about actively going after underrepresented, right? That's uh, something uh, aligned with that. Right? Yeah, that'll be an amazing data set. Can I quickly request, uh, some of you have already volunteered to uh, be part of this human diversity analysis effort. Anyone else who has, who's generating a large single cell data set, or, or a single cell data set in a reasonably sized cohort that's diverse in some way, you know, geography, ancestry, age, sex, um, please, please email us, please join the genetic diversity network. And we'd love to integratively analyze all of your data. Uh, m maybe now is a nice time, if there's no pressing questions, to switch to what, is our, what are our deliverables. So uh, are there any online questions? That, OK. M do you want to kick off? Like, what, what, what? We have 35 minutes left. We have 35 minutes. OK, that, that should be good. Um, Patricia, you want, you want to start with what's our output? Uh, we, w one thing we wanted to discuss too was uh, optimization of protocols across uh, groups and different networks in order for us to be able to better do data integration later on. And there are different aspects about that, uh, places where they are collected, like who is processing the samples. Um, uh, hubs to uh, do uh, this in a decentralized way or centralized. We would like to hear your thoughts about that. 
uh, if any of you do have experience with that and would like to share. Not me personally, but the H3 Africa Consortium does a lot of this. Um, they are publishing, then they, I think, the journal as Nature Genetics has, or will very soon publish a paper about how they went about this. Um, so yeah, I can, I can provide this information at, at a later point, but I can't say it right now. <laughs> Uh, the Asian uh, network has a lot of experience with uh, data collection from different sites, right? So, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, I, I, it comes to harmonizing protocols that you mentioned. Uh, we've done an, our best to harmonize protocols across sites. Uh, I don't think it's perfect. We're still seeing what we think are batch effects across sites. And so, one general theme that's because batch effects, lab specific batch effects are just so hard to completely remove. And they may be bigger than the biological differences between two ancestries, for example. Or it may simply be that in two different parts of the world, the environment is so different, it's, that's the biggest effect, it's not the ancestry. And so what you don't know, you don't know if it's a different environment that's giving you these different molecular traits, or if it's a uh, different batch effect that's giving you these different molecular traits in, when the data generated in two different labs. So we're trying to, at least the easiest thing to analyze is when data from all diverse humans are generated in the same lab in the same manner. Then you're a bit more confident that it's genuine biological differences rather than just batch effects across sites. And so, yeah, it is a very long discussion actually, how do you harmonize protocols? How do you bioinformatically reduce batch effects after you've done your best harmonizing protocols and you realize, oh, there's still some batch effects. Uh, but we don't have a lot of time, so I really wanted to get people's inputs on what the most important thing for us, methodology, the discussion can go on, right? But what do we need to deliver at the end? And because it's not so clear. Right? We have some ideas, but we're looking for people to tell us, okay, well, what should we deliver as a genetic diversity network? I mean, with respect to protocol standardization, let me add one more aspect which is emerging now from studies by us and others that collecting the tissue in physiologic oxygen is very critical to maintain the gene expression pattern. Even if you expose the tissue to the ambient air for a few minutes, that's enough to change the gene expression pattern. So if you're talking about protocol standardization, that is something it may not be possible now to do it, but in future we need to take into consideration. Very much. There's, what we found is exactly what you're saying. It's a sample handling that gives the biggest batch effect. It's not what happens on the machine once you load the single cell suspension. Um, so it, I want to, okay, just make a guess, like an initial stab at what do we want to deliver? And, and then you can, as a, as a straw man, right? Um, or a trial balloon or whatever. So ancestry and genetics for starters. We want to say that, let's say for PBMCs, but then also breast tissue and nasopharyngeal samples so on. We want to say that uh, these different ancestries in these geographical locations in the world have different distributions in gene expression space. That, that's the, and then we can characterize the difference in where they sit in gene expression space in many ways. But some kind of measure of, you know, ancestry one is sitting here, ancestry two is sitting here. And so the cell proportions are quite different in a nominally healthy or whatever you call healthy cohort. So that, that would be one output. Related to that is uh, QTLs in all of these cohorts. And the nice thing about QTL analysis is you can do it within one cohort and then you can take the cohort as a batch and then do it across cohorts, to at least the shared genetic effects across cohorts. So those are two deliverables. Then sex is a little bit easier in the sense that you can infer it from the data and of course everybody collects that much metadata, right? Uh, male, female differences. Again, in gene expression space. Third is age differences. Again, over age, how does your distribution of cells migrate 
in gene expression space. So this, let's say, where a distribution in gene expression space is what we're using as our readout. And we're saying, how does ancestry affect that? How does SNPs affect that? How, do, uh, how does age and sex and geography affect that? So that's, that's our simplest conception of what we will deliver. So we're not delivering a list of cell types. That is the job of the tissue atlases. And we will use their cell types and then say, how does that vary uh, in G uh, based on all these four axes, right? And we'll get more statistical power. We do, let's say, male-female differences. We can do that integratively to say, what are the common male-female differences across the world? And then how does that vary? from this part of the world to that, right? Does that, how does that sound as a, as a deliverable? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even genetic ancestry defining, do you know which one are you using? Because there are multiple platforms, people use, right? 41 SNPs, 105 SNPs. Do you want to define which one is the most comfortable way to define? Yeah, so that's again a methodology question. The one thing we're thinking is, uh, with our genotyping data, either DNA-based genotyping or sCRNA-based genotyping, we'll put every individual as a dot in some kind of reduced dimensional genetic space and uh, have both continuous descriptors of where they sit in genetic space, uh, as well as clusters, some kind of data-driven clusters of where they are in gene expression space. Yeah, so I think the, the question also is, we have at least the four that you've defined, right? So they're going to be done separately in separate cohorts, or are they going to be analyzed together? In, because I, th I think that would be the most informative if you were to include age and gender in one geography and then introduce ethnicity or, or race. That would be more informative, but it also depends on what sort of sample sizes you have. And like children and adults are obviously going to be very different. But w w it also goes back to like what you were saying, what, is it going to be informed by the data sets you have? And the deliverables will be based on those data sets because they are, I presume, already collected. Or are these prospectively being collected for a particular outcome? Um, there are the two situations, the data sets which have already been collected and those are the ones that are being analyzed and data is gen generated according to what he just said, some aspects of diversity and other aspects of diversity are going to be added from now on or are being added in projects that are already currently being developed and that's why we want these discussions to come up so people can be maybe more aware of the kind of information that we need in order to make the, the, the maps more diverse. Uh, there is one. Uh, I mean, I was just going to comment on what the expected delivery is, uh, right? So uh, you mentioned uh, just, by, just by transcriptomics, you have a couple of low-hanging fruits there, which is you know, just to correlate that with age, uh, maybe smoking or some environmental things, right? What I see very challenging is to connect the, the genetics part into deliverables, because that will allow a segmentation of the data based on, on genetics, but because there's so many SNPs uh, identifying specific clusters uh, or specific differences that then you can relate to sub-proportion differences or to um, transcriptomics of the cells are more specific, but that would be the most interesting uh, part, I would say, if you can connect the, the genetics part with it. And I don't know if there is any previous experiences or trying to do that, and again, maybe the, the large consortia that are looking at genetic data already have some way of classification because I think you will need to use this information uh, and then connect it to the other part. And I think this will be an important uh, deliverable. That's a great point. Uh, I think the best precedent for this is uh, Joseph and Jimmy's work in their respective Australian and San Francisco cohorts where they get, like, I think Joseph had 980 samples and Jimmy had some comparable number of samples. They both did single cell EQTL analysis and they found that the effect sizes of their EQTLs 
were very, very well correlated between these two different cohorts, analyzed separately, processed separately, and so on. So that's very encouraging. It means we can do meaningful EQTL analysis with this kind of data at these cohort sizes. And uh, so, so in, the, in specific cell types. And that actually, surprisingly, there was not that much population-specific difference in the EQTL effect size on average. But then I'm sure if they looked for specific loci that had an ancestry-specific effect, they would find it. The statement was more broad that on average, these EQTL effect sizes are conserved. Uh, but the job is, of course, to say, well, you have effect size of 1.0 here, in a different part of the world, you have an effect size of 1.5. With enough statistical power, you can say 1.5 is different from 1.0. It's not just measurement noise. And then how does that connect to the phenotypes in that individual location? Um, just going to that point, what I wanted to say, aren't you delivering the baseline for healthy and not any EQTLs that are correlated to phenotypes, because that's what I would be interested in, because you guys create the reference, and then I come with an IBD cohort, and I'm like, hmm, <laughs> look, there's something different between them. But what you're really describing is, you figure in the genetic diversity, you figure in the EQTLs, but everything is within healthy, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize again, because you said it's only for healthy people, right? So I want to encourage you, and I think it's very valuable, extremely valuable what you do, but be clean, exclude the non-healthy people. So I think that's simple what you deliver for me. So in Singapore, we exclude them for sure, but not all cohorts, but other cohorts have different philosophies. And in the immune bio network, they do have uh, disease. So, yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, Kat Gold from Welcome. Um, I'm wondering, is it realistic to have one deliverable will be, so thinking about the timeline for this project and then all of the bio networks and the ongoing kind of draft atlasing that's happening, and as you pointed out in the beginning, it, you, you don't necessarily want to be in a position where you're adding on diversity, but actually that might need to happen in some cases. Do you think it's realistic to be able to come out of this with a minimum, some kind of baseline around um, the kind of diversity that should be captured going forward if people are thinking about producing more detailed atlases for 2.0, I suppose, and how the timeline for this project feeds into kind of potentially, you know, other projects and, and moving the atlases forward. Minimal standards for diversity. You want to take that? given that it's in a kind of iterative project. But will it come at the right, I, I, so I, I, right. Hopefully as soon as possible, because we're discussing this a lot now, so I, I really believe that it's being taken into consideration in the matter that are being uh, drawn, with the information that is available now. Because I suppose, I mean, there's, there's different ways to look at this. You could look at it, you know, if you take a step back from a kind of more of an equity standpoint, you could say simply a global reference ought to incorporate reference tissues according to kind of global population distribution, right? But it might be that you, you're trying to answer specific scientific questions. And, 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 and if you think about global infrastructure, you're not going to be able to sample everywhere. Um, so it seems like breaking it down into kind of, you know, what is the consideration for, you know, if you were starting now, what you would want to build in versus kind of where can you actually plug into existing data? If there are already large scale genetics and genomics consortia that are kind of dealing with some of this, to what extent can you already integrate with existing information? versus what is actually missing from the cellular profiling. So it seems like that's, that's one of these questions because you're the genetic diversity network, but HCA is kind of thinking about, I suppose, cellular, cellular units and, and tissue units. So understanding those intersections is where you need to care and where you don't. So are you suggesting that we 
prescribed some minimal level of diversity for each atlas? Is, is that the suggestion? It just could be. I, I suppose it seems to me like one potential output because otherwise there's a, there's a risk that every time someone will, will use their local reference or the easiest tissue source available to them, whether that's UK Biobank or, 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 or something else, um, and it won't necessarily move the project forward in terms of um, kind of global diversity. That's, it's a huge question. So I was really, and as you alluded to, the human genomics, genome sequencing, uh, exome sequencing in our community has been grappling with this for a long time. And there's enough papers in NEJM and everywhere else talking about how it's important to do GWAS and genome sequencing in diverse cohorts. And those papers have been published more than 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But there was a very interesting review paper published last year on the percent non-European ancestry genomes or, or individuals in GWAS studies over time. In 2011, 14% of individuals in GWAS studies for non-European ancestry. In 2021, that figure was 14%. There was no change, despite the fact that everyone agrees it's important. So it's, it's a heavy rock to push on, you know? It's not that easy. And uh, we have an advantage here in the Human Cell Atlas in the sense, as, as Sarah mentioned, there's been, you know, a lot of coaxing and encouragement of the funding agencies to fund, specifically fund these things. And ultimately, I feel that's where it has to come from. Someone has to fund people in various parts of the world to, to do this analysis in diverse cohorts. Otherwise, it's going to continue to be that a handful of cities in the world will generate all the data. And that handful of cities, they cannot have that much. It's not easy to get that much diversity. Uh, Mark McCarthy, Joe Integra. I wanted to bring up something that hasn't been talked about and may act as some glue about uh, around various statements that have come up here, which is, of course, you want to go from healthy into disease, and you can start capturing um, samples from diseased individuals. Then you have a hell of a job trying to work out what's primary and what's secondary, and that's a place where genetics can help. And in particular, po nobody's brought up the idea of polygenic risk scores, which I think can add, act as a very useful bridge here and take a healthy atlas when you've got genetic data and when you can use the power of polygenic risk scores that have been generated in hundreds of thousands or millions of people and so have a lot of power and face validity and increasingly are capturing some of that ancestral diversity as well. And throwing that against the data that you're generating, even in healthy individuals, may actually be a better way of getting at causal mechanisms than doing lots of studies in diseased individuals, where, as I say, it's really hard to disentangle what is primary, what is secondary, what is the result of treatment. So I'd just like to suggest that as, uh, you know, maybe something that could be a good bridge uh, from between the genetics and the single-cell genomics. That's a great comment. Um, Patricia, are you, are you looking at PRS in... So, so certainly in many uh, precision, okay, I, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, people mentioned the UK Biobank and other efforts. That's very, very valuable to leverage all of the investment that has gone into all of those cohorts. They're collecting lots of DNA, they're collecting genome sequencing, metadata. So if you want to analyze human diversity, talk to them, get some of their samples and generate single cell data and then leverage all the metadata they've already collected. So that's what we're doing, certainly in Singapore. Our profiling is on the Singapore's National Precision Medicine Cohort, who will eventually have their whole genome sequenced and a lot of metadata collected on them that we can correlate with. And in, as you know, in any precision, National Precision Medicine effort, the polygenic risk scores are, um, um, there's a very systematic effort. And so we will have those polygenic risk scores available to us as summaries of the genetic predisposition. And that, instead of correlating one SNP with the molecular trait, you can correlate the PRS with your molecular traits and your cellular abundance and so on. Uh, so basically, individual SNPs and these kind of summary statistics on top of your whole genome SNPs will be very powerful, I think. Uh, fantastic. Can you please repeat what Sarah just said so that... So, so Sarah's saying that uh, her team is doing that with the UK Biobank samples in a collaboration. In a collaboration.
uh, doing that meaning leveraging all of that uh, metadata, leveraging that cohort, and adding a single cell component, presumably. Uh, I want to go back to the uh, diversity issue. So I guess we, diver we discuss it on a very high level, but uh, I guess you guys set the policy somehow. You've got a governance structure, right? Somebody will decide. Do you have benchmarks set, or are you start thinking about benchmarks? We need so and so many people from there, so and so many people from there, and there's huge issues with sampling and stuff like that. But where are you guys? I don't know your organization. I don't know your governance. I was in different consortium before, but somebody has to decide. Somebody has to set the benchmark. Are there any? This comes to Kat's question also, can we mandate some standards? To be honest, we don't have the power to mandate anything. So we can recommend and suggest, but the moment we mandate, it just goes against the principle of the human cell atlas. And no, no, I very much see that it's a discussion, right? It's not somebody deciding, it's a discussion, but do you have anticipated benchmarks? That's probably a better expression. Not just somebody says we need that, so a discussion, how much do we need from there, there, there. So for statistical power, the honest answer is we don't know. Because we're still starting out saying how much variation are we seeing in single cell traits based on all these axes. Uh, but s some simple things are there. We want male-female balance. Uh, we want an age distribution. We want samples from, uh, you know, active outreach to underrepresented communities wherever you happen to be doing your research. Uh, those are the um, guidelines or principles, I guess. I think the mandating is becoming, it's not going to be practical because we encounter these uh, cultural issues even when you go to the community, go to the church, go to the temple, advertise, Certain cultures, it's very hard for them to participate in tissue donation or anything. So we spent a ton of money on that effort, and we have not been successful in breaking into certain community. Yes, that's a very common experience. Uh, Ellen, you had something? To, no, okay. There's nothing. Uh, please, virtual attendees, if you can hear us, please do submit your questions, uh, and I'll read them out loud to Shaman and Patricia. I think just to comment here again on what he was bringing up on having uh, ben benchmarks, I think it's a very new uh, technology and consortium, so a lot of the things are going to be built as we go, so much that many of the discussions here were not coming up before, because before the technology was more the issue, like how can you generate single cell RNA seq? And now that we can, then we're bringing up all these other discussions that have been already discussed by geneticists and other projects and large projects and consortiums in the past, right? So I think that that's the big picture, right? We are building it now. Yeah. It's I, I'll add one more point on benchmarks. Sorry, Sophia. Is we tried to say initially, you need to have at least 20 samples from each population group. Even that, some people threw up their hands and say, no. We can't do it. It's not accessible. For the, my tissue, you cannot get 20. So now we just, you know, case by case basis. Yeah. So I just, I just wanted to comment on um, accessibility um, and reaching populations. So I know that the HCA Equity Working Group uh, and have been working on deploying the technology or the utility of the technology and the benefit of using this technology um, outside of the six main cities that do this work. Um, and also by engaging researchers, clinicians, community members from those populations that we're trying to reach, this is how we're going to increase the diversity, right? So our study, um, Clearly, you can hear that I have an accent, so I'm from the Caribbean, and we've been working in the Caribbean populations and African and West and East African countries. So when we um, approach our collaborators to participate in a study like this, it's more in terms of the logistics rather than what is this about, because we've been building um, not just collaborations, but relationships for a long time, and that kind of work takes time, right? So it's, it takes a lot of energy to 
to push outside of our um, comfort zones to build relationships, but that's how we're going to be able to actually reach those populations and, and also give um, and feedback of what it is that we're finding, even at a high level, right? So that they want to continue participating because they feel that there's a benefit. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. You brought up the point of outreach and community building and community engagement. And so I really have to thank CZI. So CZI funded these ancestry networks, which you also, you also have that one, uh, to expand the diversity of data sets. And as you know, they've also specifically funded community outreach. And so that kind of long-term relationship is very, very important to understand what they are looking for, what they understand this research is about, and how this benefits them, and what they're willing to do as a cohort, or how they're willing to participate. It Again, it helps a lot to work with, say, existing precision medicine efforts here, because they have clinicians who you know, have that long-term relationship with the community and a good understanding of, of what their needs are. And we hope that within the GDN, in each community, there will be local researchers and clinicians who can guide the work to say, okay, this is the tissue type that's relevant here because that's relevant for the local diseases, for example. Okay, I think we're spot bang on time, right? Um, we, we do have 10 extra minutes if you would ah. like to take them. Uh, after that, there's lunch outside. Sir, uh, I mean, it's served in the room where it was yesterday, and then you can take it outside. And the report back is immediately after lunch, so you might want to approach the AV desk right after the session is over. But you do have 10 minutes. Maybe a good time to summarize. I, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, any, any other questions to bring up? Anyone who hasn't? contributed so far, but has something to add? I think the last point that she came up with was very important, the community engagement and the building of trust within the communities in order to be able to uh, get more representation to the to the cell atlas. That was also put up before, like what are the references we're actually uh, trying to build? And this is something that is also more or less new within the consortium that we are able to do that due to uh, um, recent funding. Before it was much harder for us to, to even think about that. So community engagement, I think, is one important issue that has to be in our minds. Uh, and hopefully we can, uh, I don't want to say do better, but we won't fall prey to this thing of everybody agreeing this is important, but then 10 years later, actually, the needle hasn't moved, you know. So, Very so good that, point. That, that, that'll, that'll take, you know, so we're pushing a, a boulder up a hill, but if we push hard enough, we, we can move it, right? And that'll really take efforts from all of you, contributions from all of you, writing grants, uh, grant proposals in this space, contributing your manpower, contributing your data, um, and then we want to put all that together and have an output by October next year. Uh, like an official published output, which means unofficial internal outputs by no, you know, not too late next year. So uh, this is this is an important grant uh, grant uh, point. Like how how do we build this? Because we're talking about this new funding and the engagement and the new communities, but the numbers of people that we're going to actually be able to profile is really small. We're not talking about hundreds or thousands of people, right? So it's not going to help us move the needle up, you know? It's still going to be very small, so we really have to keep on pushing and thinking about it and thinking about what this reference is supposed to be and uh, otherwise, right, it's not going to happen. I just wanted to add a, one more point um, from a funder perspective. You know, it, it's really important for us to hear um, an articulation of the of the major barriers and the challenges. Now, we've discussed a lot, and you know, I mean, many of them are are evident and have been evident for a long time. But you know, that could be one other output, frankly, is you know where you've been able to make progress because of existing infrastructure and resources, and where the major gaps are um, potentially globally, because some of this is about building on 
existing infrastructure and networks that are already heavily invested in, and that's not possible everywhere because they simply haven't been built yet. So it's kind of less project specific and more about that global architecture that makes research possible. Thanks for bringing that up. It's an extremely important point. Uh, one good thing about these Ancestry Networks grants is that there's a big community building, capacity building, infrastructure building component to it. Within Human Cell Atlas Asia, new teams are coming on board and setting up their uh, research infrastructure for this kind of research. And that will pay dividends further down the line, way beyond this project. So that's real, that capacity building is really important. And I'm very heartened to maybe reading between the lines what you said. <laughs> Infer that the funding agencies are looking for some kind of suggestions about you know, what, what the next grant cause would be, meaning who are the, who are the teams, in institutions, researchers, who, are, who can have more, you know, get us to a more equitable representation in the atlas. And yeah, that's, we, we would love to provide some suggestions there. All right. Uh, so thank, thank you all so much uh, for, for participating. This has been very useful. And you want to wrap it up? Or? I think we talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And there are opportunities always to be discussing with everybody, right, online, and uh, having access to all the groups is a very open um, um, uh, consortium, right? So you can always reach out. Everybody's available. Please email us and participate. Thank you so much.